Hello, can I welcome everyone to the planning committee on Thursday, 10th of September. Um, this is a video recording being recorded. Jackie, did you want to take us through the regulations why we're doing it this way? Um, it's just been held under the new coronavirus reg legislation. Um, and so any decisions that are made at this meeting, which is being live streamed, um, will be valid. Thank you. Thank you. Um, apologies for absence. Chair, we've had apologies from Councillor Huntley and Councillor Kate Oliver is his substitute. And we've also had apologies from Councillor Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any declarations of interest from members? Can't see any hands. Thank you. Uh, minutes of the last meeting. Do we agree there? Quick record for the people who were there. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we move on now to... Committee briefing on change in the planning system, using classes on a white paper. Um, who's going to take us through this, David or Mark? Mark or David, you got to unmute. Mark, yeah. So I was expecting us to go straight into planning applications and do this at the end. Um, well, that was number four on the on the list. Did you want to go into planning applications? Do it at the end. I don't mind. I wonder if that might be more sensible. So I hadn't appreciated that I was put on the agenda for planning applications, and it's so yes. thrown me. I, I don't think it's logical to do that before planning applications, and members of the public may be watching for. Um, uh, yep. Happy to go through the change to planning system. In the, no, you're I'm okay, Mark. Um, we'll, but, we'll move uh, on to the applications and do that at the end. Yeah. So we'll go straight on to 5A, which is the application for Eaton City of Norwich School. And it's on pages 21 to 36. And Mark, are you taking us through this? Yes, I'll take you through this. Thank so you. I'm going to share the, uh, share the presentation uh, to begin with. Um, uh, Jackie or somebody, are you, uh, you've, uh, you're going to need to enable me to share my screen. I don't currently have the permission to do so. I just want to check, Jackie or Callum, did you, did you hear that? I need to, permission to share my screen. I think they're trying to work it out, Mark. Oh, there we go. Right, I've got it now. Thank you. Can okay, I just, before I proceed, check everyone can see that? Keith, can you see the Yes, can do now, yeah. Yep, okay, brilliant, right, I'll continue. Okay, so um, the first application today is at uh, CNS School uh, in Eton. Uh, it's a proposal for uh, a new sixth form block. I'll just take you through uh, the plan. So the, the, the site's located to sort of the, the northern side of CNS. Um, to the sort of left-hand side here, we've got the main entrance in front of John T. Eton Road. Uh, there's properties along Eton Road here and to the school continues around to the sort of south of these properties and the site in question is outlined in red on the plan in front of you. Uh, it's just sort of probably a more helpful picture just showing the entrance to the school onto Eaton Road, the wider school and the location of the site here. So currently there's uh, a couple of port cabins on the site at the moment and an area of small area of green space to the right hand side of those, the eastern side, uh, which are to the rear of those properties on Eaton Road. Uh, some pictures of the size. This is the size that it uh, looks at, at the moment. Because some porter cabins. This is to the rear of the porter cabin, showing the boundary. Now, this boundary until recently, I think, had to just sort of a reasonably large layland eye hedge along it, which has been removed at some point in the, in, in the not too distant past uh, and been replaced by this two metre high fence. I was looking in the other direction. Again, porter cabins on the right hand side, the boundary of properties on Eaton Road on the left. 
Uh, sort of just looking over the fence, giving you an idea of what's uh, what's the other side. So you can see some of the properties on Eaton Road there. Again, uh, this is uh, taken sort of, uh, so the port cams here are sort of to the left of this small piece of open space. And so this is the eastern end of the uh, site in the red line. So that's that green area to the eastern side of the port cabin, looking between two existing buildings here. Um, so on the left, we've got the existing arrangement. On the right, we've got a proposed arrangement, which is for a new single story structure with a mono pitched roof um, to provide six form facilities. Um, fairly simple design, um, sort of a shallow mono pitched roof, uh, which is supposed to have solar panels on top of it. Um, and that's influenced the orientation of that pitched roof, which is orientated to the south. Uh, so you've got a roof plan there and then a floor plan. You can see there's uh, three classrooms, an ICT room, uh, a library, uh, a cafe area and some offices. Uh, now the ICT room has been um, has been moved into this proposal. There was the proposal previously included a, a proposal for a dance school uh, or dance studio, should I say, um, which if I just go back which was proposed um, to the south. Don't, can you see my cursor? Can you see me? Yes, we can see it, Mark. Um, okay. Uh, so the, the, there was there was previously a proposal for a, um, for a dance studio proposed to the south of the site. That's been removed from the proposal and in order to facilitate that uh, the, the dance studio moving to another location in the school have needed to move an ICT room into this proposal here. Um, so that's the scheme. Um, the recommendation is, is as outlined in the report. There is a statement that's been submitted by the applicant, which I think David was going to read out. Is this okay, David? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, so this is a statement on behalf of the applicant. Uh, good morning, Chair and fellow Planning Committee members. This statement has been prepared on behalf of the Ormiston Academies Trust as applicant and in support of the officer recommendation to grant planning permission for the proposed demolition. Excuse the... me, sorry, but I, I don't quite understand um, in the new rules because we haven't got any objections that are speaking. It, is this is this like instead of the applicant speaking? I'm, I'm just, can you just clarify, can you just clarify that for me why we're reading out a statement from the applicant? Um, the, 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 the rules that, that were uh, approved a couple of committees ago does allow the applicant to make a statement. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll start again. Um, good morning, Chair and fellow Planning Committee members. Um, this statement has been prepared on behalf of the Ormiston Academy's Trust as applicant and in support of the officer recommendation to grant planning permission for the proposed demolition of the two old mobile science blocks situated directly to the north of the east wing of the main school building and erection of a single storey sixth form block containing three classrooms, an ICT room, library, study stroke cafe area and other ancillary facilities. This current application follows the applicant's recent withdrawal of a previous application for a similar form of development which also included a small dance studio building configured on land adjacent to the existing performing arts block. That application was withdrawn in direct response to the concerns that had been expressed by some of the near neighbours at the time on the potentially adverse noise implications of citing a dance studio externally of the performing arts block. The applicant has therefore agreed to incorporate the dance studio into the performing arts block through a repurposing of the accommodation. Consequently, one of the existing ICT rooms needs to be relocated into the new sixth form block. The school does not have a dedicated sixth form space, and so the application proposal would provide for a much needed qualitative improvement and education benefit. The overall capacity of the school in terms of maximum roll number would remain unchanged. The new building would be a little larger than originally anticipated to accommodate the ICT room. It will be configured largely on the footprint of the old science blocks, with the one remaining science classroom relocated into the main school building. The building would be a little higher at 0.5 metres to incorporate the minimum roof pitch needed for a roof mounted PV array that would reinforce its net zero energy credentials. 
The applicant is mindful of the two objections raised locally of the visual impact of the new building to the residential properties situated directly to the north on Eaton Road. At its nearest point, the building will be situated 4.21 metres away from the northern boundary, increasing to 6.3 metres, although it is acknowledged that the screening is limited to a two metre high fence currently. As a consequence, the applicant has agreed to initiate some new planting along this boundary, according to an outline planting schedule agreed with the council's landscape officer, to help confer some additional protection in this respect. These details will be secured under a recommended condition to this effect. The applicant is aware of the importance of being a good neighbour to surrounding residents, and it is hoped that the steps it has taken to respond directly to the concerns originally raised in respect of the dance studio and with, with this current application will be received positively. The application proposal has significant planning merits in helping to sustain the ongoing livelihood of the school and we hope that planning permission may be granted in accordance with the officer recommendation. And that's the end of the statement. Thank you David for that. Um, Mark, could you put us back onto the screen so we can see all the councillors please? Yeah. So, Chair, just to just to finish off there. So, I mean, I won't go through the details of the report, but the recommendation is uh, the sort of the case is assessed by officers in the report, and obviously the recommendation is for um, approval of the of the cases outlined um, in, in in the report. Thank you. Is there any questions from councillors? No. Oh, yes, there's two. One from Judith, and then Jane. It's amazing, Judith. Yes, is, is there to be replacement planting for the trees that are lost? Yes, so there's a, the, we haven't we haven't got the details. The details will come via condition five, um, which you, which you'll see on page thirty one. Um, there has been some email correspondence between our landscape um, team and the applicant. Uh, I think the landscape team have suggested a mix of planting that could go in, in, in this location and an appropriate mix of trees, which I think the applicant indicated that they were reasonably comfortable with, but it, re it requires a more detailed scheme to come from the applicant to us. So there is a proposal to provide um, replacement planting along this sort of northern boundary behind the uh, behind the building. But yeah, we, we've not we've not got the finer details and hence why we're putting that condition on yeah. to agree those. <laughs> Okay. My, my second question is, um, does this proposal represent an increase in the number of pupils attending the school? Uh, or have no, they not so they, um, they, they've, they've, got, they've got a certain role, I think it's about 1,700 at the moment. I, 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 I have this exact figure somewhere, I don't, don't have it immediately in front of me at the moment, but uh, they, I think I believe the, the, it's about 1,700. I think it might be detailed in the report, actually. Um, Where was it? Um, but no, it doesn't increase the uh, it doesn't increase the, uh, the student numbers that can be taken uh, by the school. Uh, it's it's, it's, yes, it's, it's really just improving the um, the conditions and um, amenities. Yeah, Thank they you. don't they don't have particularly devoted. Uh, I don't believe they have devoted um, facilities for six forms at the moment, and this is aimed at providing those better facilities for six form students. That's just amazing. Thank you, Chair. A couple of things. I'm presuming, given the layout plan, if I've understood correctly, that the, the, the neighbours who complained about the potential noise from a dance studio, studio would be different neighbours because from where the uh, plan sh showed, it was it, that would have been located in a different place. Yeah. Um, I, I do know, I live not very far from this school, I do know, for example, that they, they do evening classes and they do things like Zumba. Um, so I can imagine why those uh, neighbours might have been a bit concerned about a, a fresh dance studio, you know, so I can see why neighbours would feel like that. But the other thing I wanted to um, mention was, I don't think, I don't know if we can make any kind of uh, comment on this really. I do know that that site does do evening classes generally, and maybe those residents are feeling concerned about, may not be an increase in school population, but there could be more um, activity going on in the evening, particularly if there's an ICT block there. I don't know if that's anything we could comment on. Perhaps you could give me some clarification, Chair, or somebody. Thank you. Um, that, well, that sounded more like a, a comment to me than a question for planners. Mark? 
Well, there's there's no. I mean, uh, the, the the floor. If you if you have a look at the floor plans, essentially we've got some classrooms, library, and um, and some other of accommodation is there's no there's no facilities in here that would necessarily support things like um i don't believe it's the sort of accommodation that would sort of things like evening um fitness classes or anything like that i mean clearly it could potentially support um evening teaching potentially um obviously this is one of numerous areas of accommodation on the on on the site um uh, we, we're not proposing restricting the hours and i think sort of evening teaching i would be minded to suggest would would, that, that doesn't involve sort of fitness activities would be might would be likely to have sort of fairly minimal um, impact compared to the existing arrangements. But um, yeah. okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, no other questions, there, Councillor Stutley. Thank you, Chair. Um, forgive me if this was covered in the statement. I had a few sound problems. Um, the uh, issues that the uh, respondents have had were about noise. Um, and particularly about students congregating outside. Um, are there any plans within this um, or, or covered um, to suggest that there will be an outside area for sixth form students? Please. Mark? Um, there's, there's merely the circulation spaces around it. I think there was some concern about possible congregation behind the building, although the space behind the building will be fairly limited by the time we've got the replacement planting in place. Um, to a certain extent, that situation exists at the moment with the current porter cabins that are in place. There's areas behind those porter cabins where potentially students might uh, congregate. So it's large extent it's an existing situation, which is not particularly changed uh, to, to a great extent, I'd suggest, by this proposal. Um, in fact, it may even be, be improved by the fact that you haven't got this uh, sort of small area of space to the eastern end of the port cabins. Um, I think the school are sort of suggesting that they would try and uh, take measures to, to attempt to manage this so that you don't get students congregating behind the building. Um, but they need, they need that access behind the building for emergency egress from the site, so they can't necessarily completely block it off. Okay, thank you. The recommendation is... Oh, Councillor Stutley? Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I have uh, one more question. Uh, I couldn't see from the plans uh, how much of the roof was to be covered by solar panels. Um, can you... Um, uh, do you know what percentage of the roof is covered by the panels, please? Um, this is quite a large percentage. If you have a look at the, if you have a look at the final plan in your committee report, you'll see a roof plan, and you'll see that that, that you know what, what what's shown there covers pretty much the full extent of the building. Um, hopefully, that's clear from that from that plan. Okay, thank you. Recommendation is to approve. Have I got a second for that? I will move it. Thank you, Councillor Maxwell. Uh, we move on to discussions. Any discussion, Councillor Lovick? Thank you, Chair. I, I, I did object to the previous planning application that included the dance studio. Um, but I, the, the objection was, um, was, was um, really focused on the dance studio and supporting residents of Branksham Close. And Councillor Samazi was quite right when she said uh, that that application did affect different, um, different residents. But um, I, I didn't have any issue with this um, sixth form um, centre uh, replacement. So I just want to make that clear. And this is a different application. Um, so I, I do feel that, that as it's only single story, um, and, and um, it is replacing buildings that are already there and at a, in an area where there are um, very long gardens attached to those um, places on Eaton, um, Eaton Road. So I, I feel that um, those objectors shouldn't be, shouldn't be too adversely affected because I say it's a replacement of buildings already there. Um, and, and um, if, if they were used for evening classes, I don't think that would, in, would um, affect, the, um, affect the amenity of the area. I think all things considered, um, I, I think it, you know, it, it should go ahead. 
Um, it's disappointing that that tall hedge that was there dividing the gardens from um, the school grounds was taken down, certainly in the last two years. It was a substantial hedge. And now the school are going to plant a, another hedge to help with the, um, the barrier there and, and, and sort of diffuse any noise. So that's disappointing. But I know with schools, it's sometimes difficult to make long term plans and um, it, they have to do things when money becomes available. But I hope that the, uh, the actual um, implementation of this scheme um, will not result in further um, or any um, um, loss of um, privacy or amenity for those um, people um, who live along the boundary on Eaton Road. So I'm happy for it to go ahead, especially with the replacement planting of the trees. Councillor Stooley. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I have a uh, daughter that's in the sixth form here uh, at this school. Um, and it was disappointing to see that they've received communications from the school saying that this is already going ahead. Um, so um, I think they got ahead of themselves a bit there. However, I'm going to support the, the scheme because I think it's, it is um, an excellent replacement of what is already there. And the building type here is, um, is, a, is a great way of building. It's modular um, and it can go up very quickly. And I believe they, they plan to finish by uh, January next year, which is excellent. Um, so um, I'm fully supportive of this scheme. Thank you. OK, there's no one else indicated to talk, so I'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show and keep your hands up, please. That is unanimous, Jackie. Thank you. That's been our past. We now go on to the, the next application. When I can find my report. It's 5B and it's 105 Gypsy Lane and it's on pages 37 to 48. And Mark, if you could take us through the report again, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So this is a uh, proposal at uh, Gypsy Lane. It's, it's not had any objections to it. It's before you today because it's a, an application by a member of staff. Um, so I'll run through it. It's a, it's a household application. The, the property is located at 105 Gypsy Lane. Um, as you may know Gypsy Lane sort of splits around both Thorpe Road, so there's sort of two sections of it. This is sort of the eastern section. Um, so the, there's, a, there's an existing bungalow and an existing annex located here. Um, just a bit more detailed uh, view of the property. Again, the bungalow and a, an existing annex. Uh, I'll run through some photos of the property. So this is the existing bungalow to the right. The existing annex. So this annex was granted um, consent uh, to be changed from a, I believe, a garage to a to an annex. Uh, I think back in two thousand and seven, uh, as outlined in the in the sort of planning history at paragraph five. Uh, that's a view of the annex. There's some building works going on next door. Replacement dwelling was granted next door, so the building works you see in the background are not on this um, not on this uh, not on this site. Uh, this is looking at the uh, rear of the bungalow. Sort of fairly, fairly sort of attractive detailing around the around the around the bottom. Um, this is the front, and this is looking back to the garden with the annex on the, on the left, uh, and some more photos of the annex there. Sort of the garden area, I believe, behind the annex. It's looking back towards the annex, and uh, so this is a view inside the annex. Um, the, come on to relevance of this uh, shortly. Uh, sort of small living area in the annex. And so the proposals are for some small extensions to the um, to the main uh, house. There's a small porch extension, a sort of side infill and a single storey structure here. Uh, and there's also a proposed rear extension to the annex itself. Uh, just looking at how this affects the plan. So this is the existing plans along the top for the bungalow and the proposed plans to the bottom. Uh, so fairly, fairly small extensions here to the bungalow. Um, the elevations of the bungalow. Uh, so you'll see there's the porch here. Um, some, again, the, the porch. Uh, so, and then at the rear, we've got um, so the single storey extension here. And uh, so there's an infill extension on the, on the, on the side. 
uh, just looking at the at the annex proposal so there's an existing annex which is reasonable and reasonable size uh, for, for for an annex and it's proposed uh, this proposed additional extension to provide a further living living space to the rear uh, just looking at the elevations uh, so this is the extension here um, to the uh, to the, so the, here, here we've got the existing elevations on the left hand side of the page and the post on the right and the extension to the annex is, is this section here. Um, just some visualizations of the annex itself just showing what's being proposed. Um, now there's, um, there's the, the, in terms of design and amenity which are the typical considerations we look at in, from uh, with household applications uh, we're, we're we're fairly comfortable that there's very minimal impact with these proposals. The extensions to the bungalow are quite minor, um, well distanced from uh, the boundaries of the property. Uh, and th there's obviously this extension here, which have, may, may have some degree of impact on the property to the uh, east, but it, it's fairly limited. And given these gardens are south facing in any case, um, any impact would be fairly minor. Um, the sort of consideration which is slightly unusual on this one is, is, the, is the issue of the annex and whether it may, retains its sort of ancillary nature to the main house. Now, as far as annexes go, this is pretty big and this was sort of a bit of a borderline issue for us when considering the application. Um, however, the Can annex is... Can I stop you, Mark, for a yep. second? We lost one of our councillors, I understand, okay. and we need to have everyone here for to continue. If not, she won't be able to participate. Could I ask Jackie what the rules are now? Can we just wait until she tries to get in? Leonie, would you do me a favour? Would you try and ring Kate Oliver just to make sure she's got all the details to get back in again? Thank you. Yep, so we'll do. I'll just, just stop the share so we can see more easily who's, who's Thank you. Doing, who's not. Yeah, we better just wait. This is the fun of Zoom meetings, Chair. It's quite hard to find out who disappear when you can only see three people when uh, you go to the planet's shared screen. That's the trouble. Uh, my colleague Leonie's here to help us to, to check that everybody's here. And that everybody's yep. Can I suggest we have a five minute break while we're waiting? All else, she's on her way in, which is good. Hello, Kate. Kate, can you hear us? Hi, apologies. I had internet outage. I'm back. I can now. Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid, Mark, you might have to start again. Oh, sugar. That's okay. Apologies. Okay, not, 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 not sorry. Um, I will uh, just get the presentation in the right place and then share my screen. Okay, thank you, Mark. So this is an application at 105 Gypsy Lane. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... 105 Gypsy Lane, it's on the sort of eastern side of Gypsy Lane where it splits around Bothorpe Road. Uh, the property consists of a bungalow and an annex. Uh, it's showing in more detail on this screen here. Uh, we've got the bungalow to the right, the annex to the left. This is a picture of the front driveway. Um, this is a picture of the annex. Building works in the background are the adjacent side, not on this one. Uh, this is the picture of the rear of the bungalow front of the bungalow they're looking back towards the back garden with the annex on the left hand side uh, skin of a picture of the annex on the left hand side uh, looking back towards the uh, annex uh, just some more pictures of the rear garden looking back towards the annex and the new new this, so this is a replacement property which has been granted consent uh, on the property to the east and just showing you some images of what the accommodation is like inside the annex at present so the proposals are for some small extensions, a porch to the front, a side infill extension and a single storey extension to the rear of the bungalow, but also a, a rear extension to the annex shown here. 
existing plans to the top of this slide and proposed plans to the bottom. In yellow on the bottom, you can see the small extensions to the bungalow. Uh, and some elevations, again, existing on the top, proposed on the bottom, just showing some of these small extensions. So the, the porch uh, and the single story extension here. So that's fairly limited impact on the appearance of the bungalow. Uh, the annex, this is the proposed extension to provide some further li living accommodation to the annex. Uh, and this is uh, existing plans on the left hand side and proposed on the right on this slide and you can see the additional extension to the annex shown here uh, and, and a visualisation of the annex. So in terms of the, the assessment on this one, uh, it's outlined in the report but I was just outlining to members um, just, just, just before we stopped that in terms of uh, design and immunity, the impacts on neighbours are, well, in design terms, there's very, fairly limited impact from the road. You're only going to see this new porch, which is fairly in keeping. Immunity terms, the extensions to the bungalow are fairly minor. Uh, there's the extension to the rear of the annex could have a, a, some impact on the rear garden here, but it's far enough down the garden and these gardens are south facing, so we're comfortable in design and immunity terms that this is a uh, this is, uh, this is acceptable uh, as, as officers. Uh, the main issue which is outlined in the report is one of whether the annex remains ancillary to the main dwelling. This has been a sort of a fairly fundamental consideration on this case, um, uh, which has been so finely balanced. Uh, the, the annex is lived in by the elderly uh, parents of uh, the occupiers of the main bungalow and haven't had a, the, the, these cases, uh, this has, whether something is ancillary has to be considered on a case by case basis, but having considered the, Whilst the annex is very large for an annex, having considered the interrelationship of the annex and the use of the current occupiers of the property, um, officers were content that the annex could remain ancillary to the uh, use of the main dwelling and that effectively the property was still um, fundamentally occupied as a single, um, a single family and dwelling unit. Um, there's been no subdivision of the gardens, utilities are the same, the families sometimes have meals together. So although the annex provides sufficient combination for a, a single dwelling, we were, we were satisfied on that basis and on the use of the property. We are proposing to condition that. I think we may well put an informative on note on to make clear the basis on which we've made this decision. Uh, so that should any future occupier or owner, um, you know, use it any different, they'd be under no, um, no, be under no false impression that they, they they may need consent for anything that was a different use to what's being proposed here. Um, so the recommendation is as outlined in the report and that's on page uh, 44. And back to the chair. There's no statements on this one, I don't believe. Okay, if you could put this back, Mark, that'd be good. Thank you. Is there any questions for councillors? Uh, Councillor Button. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the uh, plan that we just saw, where the uh, annex is, there's like two outlines in the next door garden. Are they anything significant at all? That was as listed as 95, which I... Don't believe so, but the, the neighbouring properties changed quite a bit because we granted consent for a replacement dwelling there. Um, I, I don't have the plans for that replacement dwelling in front of me, but certainly that the, yeah, that has that has changed. The, the, what's next door to the east has changed um, from what's shown on the plan. These plans these, these show the sort of previous building which has now been demolished and it's being rebuilt. Uh, but you could see the you could see the rebuilt. You could probably see that in the pictures. I, I've got, I mean, if I can quickly share this uh, this picture again, which sort of shows the relationship between the rear of the ant. So there's the rear of the annex. This is the properties being built next door. So you can see that sort of set back from where this um, new extension is proposed. So hopefully that picture helps. Okay, any more questions? Now it's been recommended for approval. I'll move that. Could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Maxwell. Any discussion? No, oh, Councillor Peak. Uh, just to say, uh, that used to be in Wenson Ward before it went to Nelson Ward before the boundary changes. I used to deliver on Doorknock around that area 
and the ground is big and it will accommodate the new extensions on there. So I agree with it totally. Thank you, Councillor Peak. There's no more discussion. We'll move straight to the bill. All those in favour of the recommendation to approve, please show. That is unanimous again. Thank you. So it's passed. Uh, we move on now. Do you want to do number six or number four, Mark? I think, Jerry, if we if we take the public speaking and then um, do the discussion about the the, the amendments at the uh, at the end, if that would be acceptable. Yes, no problem at all. So we we okay. go straight on to seats. Revision to the public speaking, which is on page forty nine fifty six. I think Dave has taken us through this. Yeah, I won't take too much time. Um, basically, the um, when when the um, decision was made to kind of um, restart um, the planning application committee um, virtually, um, we kind of had a, a, an interim arrangement to allow the public to address the committee, which was by the submission of statements. And obviously, we've heard. Um, a statement this morning and we had statements um, last committee. Um, however, um, members um, were um, quite adamant and I think rightly so that they wanted us to look at um, ways of getting the um, public more involved in the committee. So the, um, the report that's before you kind of sets out um, our thoughts and our recommendation on that. Um, it sets out the in, in the appendices, it sets out um, what the current arrangements are, what the previous arrangements were. And at Appendix C, which is the kind of meat of the matter, is um, what we are proposing. I think the, um, uh, the, the, the point to make on, on this one is that as officers, we are proposing this as a kind of a, a permanent amendment to the provision uh, for public speaking. And, and that's why we haven't specified in the Appendix C um, reference. We haven't made reference to Zoom or anything like that. This is intended to cover um, people speaking at both um, a face-to-face -face meeting, um, whenever we're able to have those, but also at um, the, the more imminent Zoom, um, virtual meetings as well. So the headlines of um, what we're proposing is basically that um, six um, members, uh, six parties may, who have previously made representations on planning applications coming to the committee may address the committee. They will have the option to either address it through making a written statement or speaking in person at the committee, whether that's either, um, whether that's virtually or whether that's actually face to face. And the proposal is that um, those, those people who speak are um, limited to um, three minutes. Um, so that, that's, that's the headline. There, there are some kind of um, slightly more nuanced elements to it for example um, if we have um, <clears throat> if we have um, people making representations both in support and against an application um, we would um, the, we would offer and there's more than and, and, and there's more than kind of three of each uh, um, in, in opposition and in and and in um, support then uh, it would be a maximum of three uh, uh, in favor and three and three against. Uh, but essentially, it's a maximum of six um, um, people making representations and uh, three minutes for those speaking. And the intention is that the, 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 the same rules apply in terms of um, statements. So it will be 500 word statements can also be read out up to a total of six. So that, in summary, is, is the proposal. Thank you, David. There's also a clause in there that the chair get discretion if there's a big application and there's a lot of speakers. So if we had something like Angus Square come in, definitely the chair would let more people speak. Um, Councillor Burgerline. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I don't quite understand why we're, why you're proposing to make this change. I personally have all the time that is needed for residents who want to make representations in objection to planning applications. I do, I do think that, you know, it's up to residents what they see as a significant application because they will live next door to it and they will, you know, it's up to them to, to decide whether they take up the time and come and speak to us. 
it, I, is it to streamline meetings? Because I don't think that is necessary. In my, I've sat on this planning application committee for a long time, and I think you know we we do. It does give us an idea of how strongly people feel. So I, I kind of I fundamentally don't agree with limiting um, the speakers to six speakers to make a plane. I don't quite understand why we're proposing that. But if for whatever reason that goes through, I do not think that is a fair representation to have three and three speakers against and in 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 um, in support. Because if there's 27 people who object and three who are in support, we get a very biased picture of it so I don't really agree with that either I kind of I can probably get behind the change that the applicant can get six minutes if there are many applications you know that is something I can agree with if they need more time to make their point but I fundamentally don't agree with limiting the amount of speakers because I don't think we've ever been in the position where you know things got out of hand and we spend too much time on uh, listening to residents. Councillor Sands. And then right, Councillor Lubbock, and then Councillor Neil. I would have to, I did have my hand Councillor, up before. Councillor Sands yeah. first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Stonjo makes some very, very good points there. And we have very rarely had planning uh, applications with uh, speakers get out of hand. Um, where we've had a lot of speakers is because, because it's been something that has been quite highly controversial. And um, the, I think she makes the point well that if there are a large number of objectors and um, uh, we've got three objecting, three speaking in favour, where there's only a few speaking in favour, there, there does seem to be uh, an imbalance there. So uh, I'm not sure that I think this particular aspect of change is a good idea. Councillor Lovett. Um, yes, just can I just for a bit of clarification, um, so if there are six, maximum of six speakers, you add on the um, councillor and the um, applicant, that makes eight. Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's correct. It, it's yes. six, six um, Plus, members of the public. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, should we, um, if it's not a virtual meeting, then the, um, anybody who cannot come along or um, for what, any reason can't make um, a statement, they can appoint an advocate to make the statement. And that and can that be the councillor? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Cash. And even if, um, sorry to go back to the first point, um, oh no, it's part of the advocacy. Um, even, can the councillor be the advocate even if they have already spoken? Um, I'm going to kind of defer to Jackie on that one. Are you, are you talking about a situation where the, the, the councillor has spoken as the ward councillor and then also yeah. wants to advocate on behalf of a, a, a member of the public? That's right. I Jackie? Think, well, I think you probably get a little bit of duplication in that case. I mean, it might be well, that, I mean, they, if the person didn't want to attend, they could send a statement in this issue. They, couldn't they? That would be read out. And then the ward councillor could then speak on behalf of residents generally, which is what the provision is for, as far as I understand. Well, it's just that if they have a particular point to make, and you know, they, you know if the ward councillor has used up all her his, his or her time in the three minutes, then it, another person wants to make a particular point or points, um, but can't speak. Um, is the councillor able to speak as an advocate, even though they've already spoken on different issues. Well, my, my, my <laughs> view is that essentially the what we've written there does allow for that. Yeah, um, okay. and I think that's... Yeah, there, there might be a degree of repetition, but fundamentally, if you want to be a ward councillor and separately as an advocate, then so fundamentally what we've written there would allow for that, yes. That's my view. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, to, to go back to the um, curtailing of numbers, I, I, I do think think that um, I agree with other speakers it's rarely been the case that we've had more than six and if we have it's because people feel so strongly and when people feel so strongly about something if they come along and want to speak and we're saying oh no we're only allowing six you know they do feel um, peeved that they haven't ha had had their say as it were so I think for the very small number of cases where we have a lot of um, objectors 
I think it's important to at least allow people to have their say um, and, 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 um, and um, for, for, for that reason, allow the meeting to go on a bit longer than perhaps um, this, these um, regulations would allow for. Um, so, so I'm not in favor of, of, of curtailing the um, public speaking to just six speakers. David, did you want to come back first, and then oh. Councillor Neil, and then Councillor Smasey? Yeah, um, I think from from an officer point of view, I mean, Councillor Bogeline asked whether the the intention was to kind of stream streamline the meeting process, and and the, the, I think the honest answer to that is is yes, because I think certainly from um, when when we get more than maybe three or four people speaking against an application, my experience of the committee, both here and, and in other authorities, is that the points that get made to do, do tend to get fairly repetitious. And the value um, that is added to the decision-making process by um, having a large number of people making the same point over and over again is, um, is, is 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 questionable in my view. Councillor Neil. Yeah. Um, before COVID um, lockdown, we didn't have any restrictions, and I've been on licence and committee for quite a few years. And it's very rare that you get that many people wishing to speak. You might get a lot of people object to a contentious um, plan, but. Uh, unless it's a very big one, as you say, like Anglia Square, um, it's not normally a problem. And to put these arbitrary uh, six, a number, number of six there, and as Councillor Bogelain said, you know, if you've got 27 of voting, uh, of, of objected and want to speak, and, and three wanted to um, uh, advocate for the project, um, you'd have an unbiased um, display on the day. Um, and I'm no disrespect to the chair, but I don't think that should be in his power to decide whether or not the others can speak. Um, and just to bring up the point that um, David just made um, about uh, points repeated, uh, all I can say is so be it. You know, if, if you happen to have eight or 10 people um, wanted to have their opinion and it happens to be repeated, to my mind, that actually... Uh, adds weight to the feeling of the people in the area. Okay, can I just say that I've never refused anyone a chance to speak at all, except if they've already spoke before. Uh, case is amazing. Well, yeah, yes, case sorry, of Chair, but that's not the point. It's that you would have um, the choice to or not, whereas before... I have the choice now. Case is amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, well, two things. First of all, I echo a lot of what's been said already about limiting the number and also limiting the number of times any individual can speak because you might want to make a different point. But that wasn't what I was going to say. What I was going to say was um, if if we're thinking about trying to encourage people to be more involved and and you know engaged, which I think I would hope we would want that to be the case, is it possible in the future? to use the mixed approach of having some people giving their, reading their own statements out or giving their own three minutes via Zoom if they feel that they can't, for whatever reason, get to the City Hall when we get back to face-to-face -to -face meetings. Because I'd like to see this as, I know we talked about streamlining meetings, I suppose I'd like to see it as a way of actually facilitating people that maybe, for whatever reason, couldn't get into City Hall before. And you might find that there's more engagement, there's more interest in this process. So is that a possibility in the future, please? I think the short answer to that, if I may, Chair, is, is that I, I, I don't know. I think, um, I mean, at the, at the moment, the the regulations that we're holding this meeting under um, allow us to, to do it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether or not they would actually allow um, a, ble a kind of blended meeting, and I'm not sure if we would want if we were to revert back to the previous regulations, whether whether or not they would allow a blended meeting either. I mean, it's something that we can kind of look 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 to doing. I think there's also um, 
we, we would need to get the committee room set up so that you could that members if, if that was to happen that um we'd have to have the facilities in the in the committee rooms to so that people could actually speak um and address the committee remotely so there's an it issue but i mean i, I maybe maybe that's kind of an issue that um needs to be taken forward kind of corporately because it might well apply to to other council meetings as well um but certainly in the short term um i would i think it's unlikely that we could actually have blended meetings but it, it's something that we we, we we could look at but it's not within our capability at the moment no, crazy. And, I, and i accept that we we're not doing face-to-face -face meetings i was thinking about people with disabilities for example or people with young children you know who can't easily get out if we're trying to be more accessible and and and, and promote engagement but thank you for your answer thanks very much council burglar yep yeah. thank, thank you for thank you for this uh council samizi I've, I've been raising this with um with the corporate leadership team as well as as the leader of the council so I'm, I'm really hoping that going forward we can have mixed meetings and um, i just wanted to quickly come back to something that david um raised uh, about the repetition of points you may know that a lot of the uh, contentious planning applications tend to fall into mancroft ward and we really you know we really try very hard to advise residents that you, they should coordinate because it's it's in their own interest to put the points to us in a succinct and convincing way so you know I think there is a role for the ward councillor to work with residents to try and uh, uh, coordinate them um, and I also think if we have the if we have the rule that you know the first comes first serves um, you you cannot guarantee that they don't make all the same point and then the others are being lost so I think that will not avoid uh, the issue of uh, repetition of points and it will it may mean that others that we need to hear are not being heard Councillor Neil. Yeah, there's a question to the officers. Um, the chair just made a statement that uh, pre-COVID, um, he had the power to um, not allow people to speak if he so wished. Is that correct? Or was that correct? I think, I think yeah. previously the chair had discretion. Yes. So yes. although there was unlimited numbers beforehand, uh, if someone turned up on the day, um, Ah. To speak, for example, the chair would occasionally use his discretion to allow them to speak. So there's a requirement to register beforehand. And so there, there were occasions where I believe the chair has used his discretion in the past, but ultimately yeah. there was an unlimited number. Um, yeah. Sorry, that, that's a discretion um, to allow somebody to speak who hadn't put in the, you know, in, in, in a timely fashion. Um, but did he yeah. have the discretion to actually stop certain people from not speaking in the yeah, first place yeah, if they put it in, in the time especially, especially when people put the plans in the designers or something and they're not allowed to talk i sometimes have said no they can't council sands it's not the question i asked well the that's nothing that's nothing to do with this meeting what you're asking Councillor neil Sands. Well, um thank you chair um again uh and makes a good point there and I've done this myself where we've had something come up there have been a number of complainants who all wish to speak at uh, planning I suggest that they get together beforehand and go through their main points of complaint or objection or need the support and organise their speeches or speaking so that they have a minimum level of cost over so that way they reinforce uh, what they're going to say. So yeah, there is a role for ward councillors in this. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sands. That was a bit quiet. I don't know if it's something of your speaker. Um, Councillor Stukely. Uh Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I agree with most of the points made so far, especially about the limit on numbers. Um, so um, at this stage, I would like to propose that we remove that limit from... Uh, uh, from this proposal um, as set out in Annex C um, and, um, and go from there. Councillor Bergelon. I don't know if you said, I couldn't understand your name, but I'd like to second the proposal, please. Okay, thank you. David? Chair, yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of get the feeling that um, the committee want the public speaking arrangements to essentially be what they were like pre-COVID. 
um, which is the uh, effectively reverting back to the um, speaking process as set out in Appendix A. Um, I don't know whether either Jackie or Mark want to kind of comment on that. That's that's the kind of feeling of the meeting that I'm I'm, I'm getting. Yeah, that's uh, the feeling I'm getting as well. I mean, all, all, all I'd say is that um, we are quite rare as a planning authority in having unlimited speaking. Um, if you we we if you look at if you look at our neighbours and most other planning authorities, they will have some sort of limit, and it is principally to try and allow a degree of public speaking whilst whilst managing resources. You know, I can think of a number of occasions where we've where, where public speaking on one case has taken over an hour um in the fairly recent past and so we, we we're trying to, to we, what we were trying to do as officers is strike a balance between resource implications which as you all know are a significant impact issue for local authorities trying to deliver essential services within our remits and within our resources um so that planning committees hopefully make good decisions offer a degree of uh, offer off of public's ability to um, to input into those meetings, which there's no legal obligation to to allow public speaking, although clearly it's a it's a thing that most most councils do. Um, so to strike that balance between making good decisions and having uh, you know having, and keeping meetings within a reasonable length um, and, um, and and time period, so that. I just wanted to say that that's the, that's the reasoning behind this proposal, and actually, we're these proposals are still very generous, gen, generous compared to a number of other authorities. If we look at just just for a comparison, which I, I hope this may it may help, but for example, Broadlands District Council allow objectors a total of fifteen minutes uh, and a maximum of five minutes per person. So essentially, that's um, you know that, that that's that's more restrictive. Uh, uh, South Norfolk, if, if if I use you know I'm using our neighbours solely because they are our neighbours. The South Norfolk allow any number of speakers, but up to a five minutes in total. Um, um, so you know the, 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 our, our our suggestions here are quite generous compared to sort of um, na neighbouring authorities, but but try to pull back from that sort of unlimited number we have at the moment, albeit with. Uh, the caveat that the chair has discretion in in sort of really significant cases that we would want to uh, you know allow a wider public speak and so as long as it's just that's that's the that's the sort of some of the reasoning and logic behind some of the proposals and so and just if i may although although i think get the impression that the there's a desire to go back to the original there are some issues with the original irrespective of whether we have limits on numbers which i think were were, were, were perhaps not entirely um um, and fair. The for example, in the previous one, we could have we can have an hour's worth of objective speaking and only give the agent three minutes to 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 speak and respond to that. Which I think we were trying to sort of strike a bit. So I, I would suggest that perhaps there are elements of the new one, even if you do decide to revert largely to the old one, that you may want to change. For example, giving the agent a bit more time where there's you know an excessive amount of objective speaking, so that they can respond. But um, I'll I'll. I'll hand back right now. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Jackie? Um, I just wanted to say that the, if you did revert back to the original, the statements are quite useful for people who can't attend meetings. And then they can be reproduced either in the updates reports or sent to members or read out as possible. I just thought that's quite useful for people who can't attend meetings. I just want to have one final say on the report. Thank you. Okay, I've got three councillors waiting. Councillor Neil, you're third. I've got Councillor Bergelein. Yeah, that was exactly uh, what I was going to say. That um, if we if we revert to the old one, I think the the change to um, have longer for the applicant makes sense, and also the change to statements makes sense. So if we can formulate a way of keeping those changes but reverting to the unlimited numbers, Jackie. Councillor Samazi. Right, yeah. I mean, I think allowing the applicant to speak for six minutes, um, if if there's nobody who's objecting to it or, or, or who's from a member of the public, that seems like a long time for that person to kind of, having been given already a very detailed report. I mean, I, I don't know if there's some kind of rubric or something that we could work out, you know, depending on how many are objecting to kind of get some kind of balance. That's all I was thinking, really. 
Councillor Neil. Chair, Chair, that's not the proposal, just to clarify. No. The, the, the proposal is for the agents would only speak if there's other registered members, other other registered speakers. So if you look at bullet eight of yeah. uh, appendix three, so it's, it's only if other, in it, in it, it's only if other speakers are registered to speak, the agent gets to speak. But if there's more than one objector, the agent then has six minutes to speak is what we're proposing. Councillor Neil. Yeah, could I recommend rather than go back to Appendix A, um, pr the prior um, COVID-19 arrangements, why don't we just remove, um, seven. go for Appendix C, but remove uh, number seven. Yeah. You that need, Councillor Stutley, you need to um, reject your motion what you read first and Councillor Bogeline, you have to no, agree. But that's exactly that what Councillor Stutley suggested. Yeah, yeah. Can, can that, I is just... what, that is the motion that we've got on the table. Okay. Can I just make one point, Chair? There's the that you may want to um, retain the last sentence of um, bullet seven, uh, but alter it so that the chair may, at his discretion, allow more members of the public to speak on significant major. Actually, no. Sorry, you know you don't need that, do you? No. Sorry, ignore that. Okay. Councillor Stutley, you moved, so you're the last person to speak on this. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, so personally, I'm quite happy for Norwich City Council to uh, to stand out and um, and have a different uh, process, um, and uh, especially um, to allow people to speak. Um, it works quite well in um, in the uh, licensing subcommittees uh, where people are actually not restricted necessarily. It's it's entirely down to the chair's discretion. Um, I'm not actually that comfortable with um, uh, with applicants having six minutes to speak because um, most questions uh, should be answered during uh, during the um, presentation. However, I would be um, I would be in favour of people um, being questioned by a committee, so applicants being questioned because quite often we have unanswered questions um, and we're not able to ask the um, applicant those questions. Uh, but going back to this proposal, I think that is the um, a sensible solution removing item seven okay it's been moved and seconded uh, all those in favor please show that's unanimous no it's yes it's unanimous thank you anyone else wish to say chair. Uh, jackie sorry chair can i just make clear you, you have not moved that the applicant can be questioned because that would be Completely different procedure and not suitable for planning. Yeah. Chair, can I just ask one one thing before we before we find out? Is it in terms of the chair's discretion? I'm just trying to see. In, in the current one, I think we had something in there to, did did provide some chair's discretion on on you know if there's an exceptional case where we need to revise the proposals. I don't know if the only place we've got that is in paragraph seven, albeit it was referring to the number of speakers. I don't know if we might be prudent to add a to, to keep something in there which suggests the chair could have some discretion to to change these these rules if there's some sort of exceptional case. Not necessarily to make them more restrictive, but I would imagine potentially just to uh, add some further flexibility on, on in the um, in, in certain cases. Um, can I just come back on that? I think that there are a couple of other points where the chair does have flexibility. Um, Okay, thanks, um, yeah, a five. The chair may allow a longer period for representations to be made in complex cases. Um, and three, there's discretion about changing. So, I, 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 unless anybody else disagrees, I think there is the discretion there. Thank you. Are we all happy with the uh, Councillor Stutley? Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just um, going back to uh, some other comments that have been made um, by officers about streamlining the uh, committee process. Um, I believe um, the um, incidents where we have lots of speakers is quite rare. Um, and uh, in the case of Anglia Square, we had a separate meeting for it. So um, uh, in order to streamline the process of a, um, of a single uh, committee meeting, we can have separate meetings for those that are more complex. Okay, I think that's... That's something the officers got to look into, I believe. Are we all happy now to move to the boot? All those in favour of the recommendations, please show. That's unanimous. Thank you. 
Can I just clarify the recommendations as amended? Yes, as amended. Yeah. Appendix C as amended by Councillor Stutley's amendment. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, we now move on to item four. Which I can, uh, it's the committee briefing on changes to the planning system in the white paper. Who's going to take us through this? Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can go through it. I think I think actually um, I, I wasn't around when the agenda was being finalised. I think it would have been helpful to circulate a, a, a document that we've pulled together on this um, to sort of give members a steer. But I, we, we, in the absence of that document, I'll sort of... Councillor Lovick? Come in, Zurich. We need your vote. Um, um, would it not be helpful for us to have that document then and discuss this at the next meeting? Because okay, it might not be to discuss. You, we just want the information. Members in favour of that? I totally agree. Councillor Sands? Okay, thank you. Can, can I can I make a, a a point, Chair? Maybe it shouldn't be a formal item on the agenda, but maybe a kind of a discussion item, either before or after the formal committee. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's what we really want: is some some information about what new rules are coming, about um, what the government has changed, like building a house on top of a house and and taking away the one or six money and stuff like this. That's what I really want to so, know. So, so if I may, Chair, what, what, can I suggest I just do a very quick summary of what the changes are now? Yeah. We were perhaps in energy, because, because the, the in terms of the consultation on the white paper, there'll be a report going to S SD panel on the 1st of October. So in terms of any council response to the consultation on changes to the planning system, um, that will go to the 1st of October um, SD panel and then subsequently to Kampner in terms of the white paper. Um, but there are some changes to um, to the to the planning system that the government has brought in uh, already, and a, a, a number of which were not consulted on. They've been brought in on the back of um, uh, COVID nineteen sort of emergency arrangements. Uh, are you happy that I sort of just quickly yep. run you through those? Okay, so since uh, s since lockdown, the government have brought in five different statutory instruments. Um, which are essentially amend secondary legislation on um, on uh, on things like permitted development rights uh, and use classes as well. Um, so there's a number of things changes. Some are perhaps uh, more sensible than others. So there's there's some arrangements for restaurants and cafes to do a temporary takeaway, even if they haven't got an A5 to consent up to the end of the 24th of March to try and. Uh, you know, respond to the coronavirus situation. Uh, there's some additional PD rights for local authorities to undertake emergency um, development uh, over over the over sort of 12 month period uh, to respond to coronavirus. Um, there's a temporary widening of the ability to use land temporarily for up to 28 days um, in a in any in, in a calendar year um, until. The end of the year, and I think that's that's there's there was already some provisions in place at the moment, but it didn't allow temporary use of land which was in the cartilage of a building. This now allows temporary use of a piece of land that's in the cartilage of a building for a different use. So I think the logic there is that, say, if you have a cafe and they want to use an adjacent um, area for um, for seating, they have they essentially have a, a sort of one month period where they can do that without seeking planning consent, and in the meantime could apply for it. Um, so I think that's sort of broadly the logic behind that sort of change. Um, uh, a number of you will be aware that there's the government um, previously introduced permitted development rights for the change of use of a number of prop types of buildings to uh, residential. The most common one we have in Norwich is offices uh, to residential. Um, and the permit development rights allow for a prior approval process where we can consider a limited number of, um, of factors. Um, they have now uh, allowed us to consider natural light into habitable rooms um, as part of that. Um, so so that, that, that's a movement in the right direction, uh, I think, because we've had some pretty poor 
our office to residential developments, which we've not been able to do anything about. Um, so it allows us to consider whether there's a sufficient light. It still doesn't allow us to consider whether um, um, the space of those properties is sufficient and, and certain other things like refuse storage is provided and things like that. So you could you could now have a very bright broom cupboard to live in uh, rather than a dark one. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, But it's certainly a move in the right direction. Um, uh, a range of new permitted development rights uh, are introduced uh, around uh, the ability to add up to two stories on top of existing buildings. So uh, you can add up to two additional stories of flats above um, certain types of properties, such as detached box of flats, detached commercial buildings, uh, terrace properties, commercial or, or in mixed use and detached dwellings. Um, so there's essentially this upward extension um, criteria. Uh, a wide range of restrictions do apply, which limits the, 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 the likelihood of them being used in Norwich. So don't, they don't apply in conservation areas, also listed buildings. Uh, they don't apply to buildings constructed prior to 1948 as well. Um, and there's limited, various limits on those permit, permitted development rights. So there will be instances where um, it, it could apply in Norwich, but it's reduced significantly by those restrictions, particularly on the sort of no buildings prior to 1948 and no conservation areas listed buildings. So um, where someone does want to do an upward extension, there's a number of, they require prior approval from us, which allows us to consider a, a more limited uh, range of, of considerations, but we still have a, a reasonable amount of areas where we can consider uh, issues on so things like highways, air, air traffic, contamination, flood risk, neighbour amenity, design, heritage and landscape. Um, there's some considerations that aren't really covered in there but they're potentially covered by other legislation. Things like ecology isn't really covered um, but then arguably we have a duty to consider that anyway as a local authority. Um, so I mean given the range of it's sort of so questionable what are the benefit of this PE right in my, in my view given the range of um, considerations which we can consider I'm not convinced it's going to be massively more beneficial than to, to a developer than just going through a full planning application process um, we will however uh, have a lesser fee for it which is uh, unfortunate and I'm not convinced the resources in processing them is going to be much um, much more reduced um, there's a three-year time limit um, and they require construction management plans um, uh, uh, and there's no automatic approval process for these so uh, lots of prior approval processes have automatic approvals where we don't make a decision within the time limit uh, that's not been introduced on these which is which is a positive um, there's also the ability to demolish buildings and reconstruct and construct new houses uh, so there's PD rights that allow yeah, complete demolition and reconstruction uh, but the, the limits some sort of questionable it's questionable whether developers will actually want to go with these because uh, the, there's limits for example you can't really exceed the, the footprint of the former building uh, it doesn't apply to conservation areas or well buildings you can't uh, it doesn't apply to uh, buildings constructed prior to 1989 so it's, it's fairly limited in that sense um, it does allow for any reconstructed building to go up um, more than um, uh, by two storeys. Um, so uh, there's a number of implications to, to those uh, which I've sort of broadly, over, uh, broadly gone through whilst running through that. The other, the other major change which is being introduced is changes to the use class order. And if I may, I may be useful just to share this um, so hopefully you can see a use class table um, uh, so this shows existing use classes in the sort of this column here and revised use classes and this has quite a few implications for Norwich um, so hopefully members will be familiar with the use classes A1 to A5 which are your more commercial retail um, professional services, cafes, pubs and takeaways. You've then got the B-class uses, which are offices and industrial uses. Um, and then we've got um, 
uh, C-class uses, which are residential type uses, and then D-class uses, which are um, broadly speaking, things like leisure, um, museums, um, institutions, uh, etc. So the grey, the ones in grey here are use classes which have not changed. The biggest change here is the introduction of class E, which uh, so class E replaces class A1, A2, A3, so that's retail, professional services, cafes, uh, and it also replaces B1, so this is offices and light industrial, uh, and also replaces D1, which is things like health centres, crushes and day uh, centres, uh, as well as D2, which is gymnasiums uh, and indoor recreation. So it's quite a wide range in use class and um, essentially the, the implication of them all being the same use class is that there won't, will no longer be a need for planning consent to change from one use class to another. Um, it's not a matter of permitted development rights, so we can't, we can't remove this because you can't, for example, serve an Article 4 direction to, um, to, 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 to take away permitted development rights because having been introduced into the same use class, uh, essentially no permitted development rights are required. It's, it's, not, it's, it's essentially considered to be not, not a material change in use and not development. Um, that has potential significant implications for, for Norwich, particularly in terms of some of our policies which aim to locate things like office uh, offices and gyms and leisure uses in more sort of sustainable locations. So for example, you could have a light industrial unit in an industrial estate which has changed to a, a retail unit or a uh, gymnasium, for example. So there are some implications for the implementation of our policies. Uh, and also it could have an effect on our ability to retain retail floor space in our centres. Um, other changes are uh, there's smaller shops. I think these, this doesn't really apply, this F2 use particularly in Norwich. This is small shops. This, um, we, they're not within one kilometre of any other provision. So I think that's more aimed at rural uh, shops, which are important for uh, local rural communities. Uh, but uh, they, they've replaced sort of small retail shops, not within one kilometre of another, another retail unit as, as F2. Pubs and takeaways have become sui generis. That seems uh, reasonably logical. Uh, other changes, we've got a new F1 use class, uh, which covers uh, education, museums, libraries, which replaces part of D1. We've got a new F2 use class, which replaces part of D2. For things like uh, communities and, uh, and swimming pools and skating rinks. Um, so broadly speaking that's the changes to the use class um, uh, and the implications are um, broadly as I've sort of outlined. Um, stop the show. Um, at the same time there's a consultation on the white paper. I'll probably keep this bit so the bits I've done so far are not covered by the SD pack, won't be covered by the SD panel report that's going to be uh, going on, on the 1st of October. Um, the bits, but what will be going to the SD panel is, uh, is, the, is, is the council's response on the white paper. And there's also four um, parallel consultations on various different changes to the planning system, which are running alongside that. Um, in in it, in it I, I'll perhaps keep the white paper bit um, slightly shorter because I say it will be covered by the SD panel report and members would, can read, if you, even if you're not in an SD panel, you can read that report when, when it's published um, and which will provide you with a lot more detail. But in essence, the government have identified a number of problems with the current planning system. Uh, my, my, my view is that some are well-founded. Um, the planning system is a very lengthy and complex process and there's certainly a need for some changes. Um, however, perhaps some of the other criticisms are perhaps less, um, le less well-founded. Um, essentially what the government are trying to do is they want to both streamline the local plan process but also put the focus of public consultation um, on the local plan side of things. So the idea essentially is that they want to move towards a zoning form of planning and they also want to move towards a rules-based form of planning. Um, I think there's a certain naivety towards some of the proposals. Uh, there's, there's this idea that if you, if you have clear rules, so at the moment planning is fairly, uh, you know, there's, it, it involves 
professional um, interpretation of policies to assess whether something complies or doesn't comply with a certain policy. Um, the idea is that instead of that, you have a more rules-based process, a bit more like building regulations, whereby if you tick the box, it should be a straightforward objective. Yes, you tick the box. No, you don't. If you do tick the box, then it's automatic approval. That's the idea. And the idea is that those rules are formed at the local plan stage uh, with, with, in, in conjunction with the local community. And therefore, there's a lim less, less need for public involvement at the, at the development management s stage of the process. Uh, this is, yeah, like I said, I think the naivety is that they seem to assume that developers will just go, oh, yes, yeah, we'll stick to all the rules and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have automatic approval. Thank you very much. Um, I, think that's, uh, I think that's unlikely. And I think this, that's, that process is perhaps more easy to roll out, in my view, in perhaps a uh, an area where you're doing sort of large urban extensions, which where you get sort of standard house types, you get a field and you, you know, you roll out a certain thing which ticks lots of boxes in terms of the rules. In an urban area like Norwich, where every site is different and the, the exact sort of height limits and, uh, and what you'd want to see on each individual site is very, um, is very different. I think that's a more difficult um, uh, uh, planning process to roll out. Now, there is a, there is a suggestion that the, the aim of the local plan, which is sort of locally specific, should be aimed at site allocations. Um, and that alongside allocating a site, a site would get permission in principle. Uh, and that permission in principle should be uh, supported by, say, a design, a master plan for the site. Um, so the suggestion is that such a master plan would help to uh, uh, respond to any adapt adaptations that are needed. Um, to respond to the particular characteristics of that site at any one time. Um, where that falls down in particular is on windfall sites. So a lot of our sites are actually, we allocate sites, some of them don't come forward, some of them do, but a lot of our sites are windfall sites. And if you haven't gone through that process beforehand, um, it's difficult to see how the rules-based system would work on, a, say, a brownfield windfall site that's got quite a lot of site-specific considerations to it. Um, and they're proposing uh, three zones, essentially, growth areas, renewal areas and protection areas. And growth areas being areas of substantial development where outline approval would be given automatically. Uh, renewable, renewal areas being areas of some development and densification, uh, where there'd be a presumption in favour of development. And then protected areas where development is restricted. Um, um, there's, there's a lot more detail to this, but I'm conscious... Um, which I could go into, but I'll sort of get a steer from members on this. But I think I've probably given a, a broad picture of some of the, the what the what the um, what the white paper is seeking to do. There's other changes, for example, they're trying to move away from some of the EIA legislation, which is driven from European legislation, which I guess ties into Brexit. They're trying to sort of simplify EIA processes and, and SA processes of uh, sort of sustainability appraisals of local plans. Um, there's an emphasis in there that they're trying to ensure sort of uh, high quality design um, and a national design code and local design codes, which would be, they're suggesting would be mandatory. Um, um, and I think some of this would require quite, if they introduce this, would require quite a different change in resourcing for local authorities uh, in terms of the, the type of skills we need. So there'd be a lot more focus on design and master planning of sites, uh, perhaps less of a focus on the development management stage and more of a focus on local planning. Um, there's other issues this, in terms of how, um, how uh, collaboration would work. They've removed, they're, removed, they're proposing to remove the duty to cooperate um, and they're also suggesting that um, there would be a sort of more light touch examination process of local plans where potentially planning authority, authorities could largely sort of push through local plans themselves, which is which is all well and good. But that, that, it was, with that in combination with the lack of a duty to cooperate could mean that um, one local authority could do something which can have significant impacts on another local authority. So I'm thinking of, you know, um, out of town retail development or something like that, for example, impacting on city centre vi vitality would be one example. Um, Is there anything about 106 money, 
marked. Yeah, so there's a proposal to remove 106s and replace SIL with a national infrastructure levy, which would where the rates would be set nationally. Um, there, that, that would be based on the final value of development and the development would need to meet a minimum viability threshold. The proposal at the moment, we've got SIL and Section 106s principally deal with affordable housing. Um, the idea is that the national infrastructure levy would be widened to include affordable housing provision, essentially, which could be on site or could be covered by the SIL contribution. Um, one concern we have about this is that by setting it nationally and introducing a, a, a sort of viability threshold, um, there's, there's, without seeing the detail, there's a concern that areas like Norwich where values are not, um, are not massively above build costs compared to say, if you look at somewhere like Cambridge, the build costs are gonna be not dissimilar to Norwich, but the values are far significantly higher. And therefore the viability of development is better and you're more likely to get affordable housing. If there's, a, if there's a viability threshold in, in, in national viability threshold in Norwich, then my concern is that it could, could significantly hinder our ability to deliver affordable housing, depending on the detail of how it's set up. Uh, there's a few other things that would impact on affordable housing delivery as well. Some of the parallel cons consultations involve a proposal to move forward with the first homes proposal, which is which is which has already been consulted on previously, but proposing that there's a requirement for 25% of all affordable homes secured through de through uh, developer contributions to be first homes, i.e. homes for first-time buyers. Um, Whereas in an area like Norwich, that's not really what the need is. If you can buy a brand new home at a discount, you can probably almost certainly afford a, a not so fancy home uh, and you can afford to buy your, you know, you can afford to get on the property market somewhere in Norwich. The, you know, the need is for social uh, rented and affordable rented accommodation, which is that, and that's going to have a hit on our ability to deliver that. The other thing which is of concern in terms of affordable housing provision is there's a proposal to temporarily lift the affordable housing threshold from 10 dwellings up to either 40 or 50 dwellings. Uh, again, that's going to have a bigger impact on urban areas because in urban areas, a good number of sites that are delivered are in that sort of smaller end uh, of the scale, you know, like small majors that are sort of below 50 dwellings. Uh, if we can't deliver affordable housing through those sites, that's going to have a major impact on our ability to deliver affordable homes in in Norwich, um, uh, and again, it has a big. A lot of these places, in my view, have a bigger impact on the ability to deliver affordable housing in urban areas than perhaps they do in, in more rural uh, areas. Unfortunately, um, yeah, and there's also changes to the standard methodology, which, which is probably worth me me, me noting, which. Um, which quite significant, based on our initial assessment, significantly changes the 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 housing numbers needed in Greater Norwich. So, uh, I think initial initial calculations that actually decrease would decrease annual housing requirement in Norwich from around 600 to 500 homes per annum, but in Broadland it would increase housing requirement from now about 500 to 900, and in South Norfolk from around 900 to 1,800 homes per annum based on the new standard methodology they're proposing. Um, so yeah, uh, quite, quite quite significant changes there. And I think certainly um, sort of raised concerns for our, for our neighbours in Broadland and South Norfolk in terms of the ability to deliver quite that quantum of homes um, in, uh, per annum um, over, the, over that period. Um, there's a lot of other detail I could go into, but I think I've probably covered the bulk of the changes there. And like I say, it will be covered in more detail in the SD panel report. Mark, could you um, send up briefing or near enough what you just said around to us so we can take it in a bit more and have a read on it? Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll pull something together. Yeah, I've got something written, written out here, which, uh, but I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, any members, anyone? Councillor Sands? Yeah, it sounds very much like the uh, generic option, basically. Um, you know, Tories organising things so that uh, they can minimise uh, 
costs to developers and maximise their profits while delivering the minimum level of affordable and social homes. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. <laughs> okay, can I thank everyone for coming to the planning meeting? Um, and we'll see see you all at the next planning meeting. Will the new rules be in then, Jackie? About speakers? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Goodbye. You okay, Jackie? Can I go away? You're gone.